Hi everyone, thank you for coming to FOSDEM and thank you for attending our presentation. Uh, I'm Razvan Kraina from and OpenSIPS uh, project and, and, I'm Livio. And, and along with my colleague Livio we'll be showing you how to build a multi-node platform using OpenSIPS. So for, uh, first of all, why use a multi-node setup? There are a couple of reasons uh, in order to scale because you probably have uh, uh, resources, uh, uh, and then you get some more clients, some more customers are interested in your services, and you need to add another, uh, to add some extra resources. You can add it horizontally or vertically, preferably horizontally, because it's cheaper, right? Uh, and you want to use low-grade hardware. Another reason is to, uh, to do geographic distribution. Imagine that you have customers in one part of Europe and customers in other part of Europe. You want to uh, have uh, nodes, like physical nodes, as close as possible to those uh, clients in order to offer a better experience for the services you, you sell. You also want to do some sort of load balancing. For example, you don't, you don't want to use all the res uh, to power up a lot of resources to serve just a small amount of uh, clients. You want to do that dynamically um, depending on your uh, platform, on your uh, business size. And probably all of you are interested in high availability uh, in order to be able to fail over in case uh, a node uh, crashes or something happens. So imagine that you have this kind of setup where you have uh, uh, some nodes in a data center in London, uh, others in Amsterdam. Uh, uh, so you have you have your nodes in order to offer geographic distribution spread all over uh, Europe. You want your customers to have a unified experience. You want your customers, all, all customers, to see uh, each other, no matter where they are located. You want your customers that are calling from London to be able to reach the ones in the Netherlands, right? You don't really want to, uh, them to be aware of your topology. You, don't want to, you never want to, for example, assign IPs to your customers just in order to do like, some sort of manual load distribution. Um, you want to allow them to use any entry point in your network that it's available. And in order for them to have a unified experience, all of them need to share the same profiles. Wherever they are, they need to see the same thing. Um, and they also need to, uh, to use the same resources too. So this is uh, a few use cases that you want to have when using a unified <laughs> platform. First of all, user location. So imagine that you have different uh, clients that are registered, some in uh, London, uh, some, in, some in Germany, some in, uh, some in Paris, in France. Um, so each of them use a different uh, entry point in the platform. Now, what happens if the guy from uh, London ca uh, calls the guy from Paris? Well, he doesn't really know where the, uh, the, the green guy is. He, he doesn't really know he's in Paris or somewhere else. So in order to be able to do that, we need to distribute the uh, data location among all POPs so that node one, uh, when, when a call gets to node one, he should know that the endpoint is registered in node two. So he's able to see uh, the customers that are in uh, node two. And there are a couple of uh, models that we use to do this. We can have full mirror. For example, all the nodes share uh, uh, this, the entire data, the entire location data, which in practice is not very, um, very useful because usually these clients are behind that. So even if I have the entire user data, I, uh, node one will not be able to reach the, the guy in France. He will have to use node two to break, uh, to break through node one. And another uh, model is federated, uh, which basically means that each node has its own set of users, and all that a, a node must know is where, uh, on which node the user is registered, and let that guy, um, uh, and use that guy's information. Another use case is uh, the profile sharing. For example, you, you might have some limits on the concurrent call a customer is allowed to make. 
So let's say a customer is paying for 100 uh, concurrent call limits, and he starts to send uh, 80 calls on node 4. Well, what happens if he decides somehow, if he decides, uh, decides to send 60 more calls to a different node? In this case, he's using 140 channels out of your platform, although he's only, uh, he's only allowed to use 100 because that was, that's what he paid for. So again, in this case, um, you'll, uh, you, have, you have to replicate the um, number of concurrent calls that are happening on each node so that when uh, node 5 gets the extra calls or whoever, I don't know, uh, whoever gets the, uh, the extra calls, he must reject the new calls so that you can enforce the limit of 100. Similar, if you want to, do, uh, to use any cast to do load balancing, you have a different problem. Um, for example, let's say that you want to reach uh, the guy that's registered uh, in node 2 and you use node 2 to um, contact him. Well, you send the invite and then you get a reply, but the reply, according to the Anycast rules, which is something completely different, is not SIP related, it's basically layer uh, 3 related, decides to go to a, different, uh, to a different node. What happens in this case? Well, the, trans the call will be completed correctly through node uh, 5, I think. However, node, node 2 will not get a reply. If he doesn't get a reply, he will start doing retransmissions. He, if he won't get the replies because all replies go to node 5, it will eventually time out and close the call. So you really don't want to do that. In order to avoid this, we also, um, in OpenSIPS, we uh, developed a mechanism that we use to uh, inform node 2 um, about uh, transaction changes. And what's interesting in this uh, thing is that basically what happens is node 2 is the only one that has the real information about the transaction. So node 5 will not construct any transaction which you might or might not know is uh, very heavy in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of resources. Um, one extra use case is uh, high availability and ensuring it using hot backups. Imagine that you start a call with node 2, but this, call cra uh, this node crashes. What happens with the call? What happens with the CDRs? Well, in, in this case, you will have to, uh, to reach another node, I don't know, using any cost or uh, DNS or whatever failover mechanism you are using. But for this guy to be able to generate proper CDRs, he, he needs to know when the, when the dialogue, the call started, right? And all sorts of information that, uh, about the call start. These are, uh, so again, you have to replicate information about, uh, about calls, the start time, and so on, in order to be able to generate proper CDR. And you also have to make sure that only one node uh, one node does the dialogue related jobs, for example, timeout. Imagine that all the nodes within our uh, architecture have uh, information about the dialogue that doesn't receive a buy. They will all generate a timeout and they will all try to close the same call. And they will all generate like five CDRs for a, a call that was never closed. You don't really want to do that. So you have to do some sort of delegating a node to a dialogue. But that's what my colleague uh, Livio will talk uh, in the following uh, minutes. So it's, in this presentation we will only talk about um, how, how to organize these nodes in clusters, how to use these clusters and assign them to different modules depending on their purposes. And all you have to do is let the modules do their jobs. Okay? I will hand my, uh, the presentation to my colleague. Thank Lego. you, Razvan. And uh, speaking of clusters, how many people here are familiar with OpenSIPs? First to go. Okay. And how many of you have played with the OpenSIPs cluster features? Okay, so um, that's what I was thinking. And uh, I, I was expecting this, actually, because I saw a lot of uh, new faces. And um, I'm actually going to uh, explain the new clustering features uh, using some uh, practical examples. And uh, here we, we, let's start with a basic RFC 30, 3261 implementation of SIP. Um, uh, and 
basically you can uh, achieve this using OpenSIFS by just loading the user location module and using the default routing config. Um, and let's apply it in real life. What is an obvious problem with having uh, this type of SIP registrar, which users hook in and make their calls either through to each other or to PSTN? What is some obvious problem? Uh, okay, I guess. Um, but what if it crashes, right? We're going to have downtime. Um, not only that, but we cannot even uh, handle a, a freaking restart. You can't, if you restart that uh, daemon, you will lose all the registrations. And the phones will have to take another, maybe for whatever, one hour, four hours to re-register. Um, OK, so we can add uh, like another layer on top of it of uh, database persistence. All good and done. Um, that's just a couple lines of config. Change the, change the user location mode and uh, hook in a MySQL URL. And uh, we're good to go. What's still wrong with this? It can still catch fire. If, if that server goes down, you will run into more downtime. Uh, you know, uh, you have to answer to your boss. OK, we explain, or, or, or maybe even more to your clients, and uh, start handing out emails, what not, answering calls, tickets. Um, so you can take this one step further. We can uh, add high availability into all of this. Um, OK, so we throw a backup node now, and we use a shared database. We uh, put in a virtual IP on top of this and instruct all the endpoints to register to the, over to the VIP using, I don't know, some sort of VRP protocol, keep alive D uh, VRP, that handles the moving of the IP and uh, the, the, uh, all that part for us. Such as, so the plan is that when the active node fails, the backup, we, we have this little backup uh, procedure, that failover procedure that says, let's reload all the dialogues from the shared database, let's recache all the registrations, and maybe afterwards the service will survive. Okay, so that's basically what we had up until OpenSIPS 1.11, when we started uh, slowly moving in, into the clustering area. Um, but what's wrong with this? <laughs> this is still not, still not enough. What's, so what are some obvious downsides of this? Well, or should I say, they're not obvious right now. It's getting more subtle. Um, one of them is the fact that this recaching procedure may take time. Uh, it, it's all good if we're talking like uh, a thousand phones, right, or uh, a thousand dialogues. But what if you have a million dialogues on one instance? How long does, does it take to query that and recache it into memory? That, that can take as good as one minute or more. So although you're saying, OK, I have high availability, you have like high availability after one minute. Um, so uh, another problem is that uh, what if the master simply does a, the master node does a reboot? Once it boots up, it recaches all those dialogues into memory. So what you have now is two instances OK, so the VIP correctly moved over to the backup instance. Um, but now you've got this uh, setup where they are both uh, duplicating the data. So OK, you're saying that might not be that bad, but um, how about this? They will both start writing CDRs now. So you, you're, you're starting to get uh, duplicates on that. And not only that, but um, half of the CDRs will be good on the backup, right, because they properly close thanks to the SIP signaling when you hang up the call. But what the master will happen is that they will hang there, and all of them will time out uh, on whatever you set the max timeout call duration, typically like two hours. And you will get this, this uh, duplicated CDRs with max duration. Try explaining that to the client when you say, OK, you, you have this call. It costs 200 pounds or something like that. Uh, uh, so another thing that. Uh, the problem with these data duplication is that um, uh, oftentimes you need to continuously ping the clients in order to keep the net binding alive. And uh, the, that, that, uh, the master node also will attempt to generate pings, and uh, he will not be able to send it because the operating system doesn't let it, since it does not own the, VI, the, the virtual IP address. And it'll flog the logs with operations, not permitted, blah, blah, blah. And, you want to prevent that. Um, so now enter the OpenSIPS clustering. 
what is the idea? The idea is that we need to give, uh, give the setup more state, make it more stateful, make the nodes uh, more stateful with each other. And uh, the idea is to replicate the data uh, live to the backup registrar such that uh, when the master catches fire, we are able to instantly fail over to the backup. It, it's, it's uh, I mean, as, as fast as the virtual IP solution can do it, but uh, keep alive, the typically fails over within one second. Um, uh, another, so this solves the failover problem. Uh, the other half is with the data ownership and solving the dreaded duplicated CDRs. So what we came up there is, and you will start seeing uh, in the documentation starting from 2.4 OpenSIPs, is the sharing tag concept where we each, so although they, the both, both instances have the data, have the same dialogues duplicated, they are using this shared tag, let's call it VIP, um, that basically says the following thing. If I own the VIP, I also own the data. If I don't own that tag, I pretty much don't have anything to do with that dialogue. Um, so in 2.4, you, you can change these tags with the, uh, the DLG set sharing tag active command. And uh, in 3.0, we move the logic over to the clustering module. I guess this is just a uh, detail. Uh, but you can hook these commands into the keep alive D uh, switchover procedure. And uh, you can automate this, such as uh, when, you s when the switchover happens, it also switches the tags. So uh, it switches the proper ownership of the data to the respective node. Um, enabling this, I mean, I, I talked a lot about this, but enabling this is done in like three lines. So um, all you have to do is uh, switch the user location into persistency mode and into the full sharing, give it a cluster, and uh, the same for the dialog. And after you create the dialog, just uh, tag it with the VIP tag. That's all you have to do. Um, OK, so is this enough now? Well, actually, we, it's, it's pretty good now, but uh, customers al always want more. It, it never stops. Uh, they, will, they will say, okay, I want 20 of these. I want 20 of these setups. So how do you start uh, handling that now? Well, we, and that's where the federated uh, idea came in, where we don't, as Roslan was saying, we don't fully uh, dumb rec replicate all the data to all the nodes. We rather keep it local, and all we share is l like some location pointers. Uh, I put in that NoSQL metadata uh, part, where if, if one call comes in in London, it looks up the metadata and says, okay, where is my exit node? It's Hong Kong. Send it over there because that node will be able to handle it. Um, a cluster table with these uh, six nodes would look like this. Notice that we have a global cluster made up of six nodes, but they are grouped using this SIP address column. And um, uh, that's the only use case for that column. Uh, so the federated user location is the only one that uses it. Um, and you just use it to group these two by two. And uh, right, as a wrap up, we, I went through the examples that handle the reachability problem, the hot backup problem. And uh, th so the solution to sharing profiles and counters is pretty much the same thing. You just enable the cluster for that respective module and the module will do all the work for you. The, and similar to any cast, probably a, a, a couple more script calls to do, but uh, there's, it's, they're all well documented. Um, so I guess the, the take out of all of this is that we've put in a lot of work into the clustering features, both in 2.4 and 3.0. That's uh, going to happen uh, by May, hopefully. And uh, yeah, we highly, it's well tested. It's, we've deployed it to a lot of our uh, customers and a lot of companies are using it. So we highly encourage you to give it a spin. And uh, also we have this uh, promo code for the Amsterdam OpenSIP Summit this year, which if you are interested in, uh, we would more than welcome you over there. And uh, yeah, you can use that to register and you'll receive like a 15% discount. Thank you very Again. much. Do we have time for more questions? One we question? <laughs> okay. Any questions in there? Giovanni? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, and uh, the user location uh, yes. synchronization is working also when it's uh, piggybacked uh, by the uh, mid registrar? Yes, uh, the mid registrar is compatible with the user location cluster and all of that.
Any other questions? Uh, hi. Uh, hi. In the past, I've also had a look at your uh, FAQs, your how-tos for, uh, for building a cluster, uh, including asterisk as media servers. My question is, because uh, in, in, in every how to y you approach this uh, as building it from scratch, what about uh, uh, PBX functions that are not purely SIP, you know, voicemail, all of that? If, if you already have existing customers, is it, is it feasible to move them to this model or, uh, or the model with uh, asterisk as media servers? Oh, well. Um uh, maybe we should have put in a uh, slide uh, towards the beginning. We don't do media at all, so we just handle the signaling part. So uh, the, the solution, although it's clustered here over the signaling, what whatnot, it will also use like 50 ASRI servers in the back, <laughs> or, yeah, so or free switch, whatever. Would be to yeah. have one instance of open switch, put it in, in front of all these servers, and be able to dispatch or balance or uh, let's say partition clients based on each uh, instance that you have. Yeah. But you might have that on your core network, so uh, we, you'll, we will use the nodes that I presented earlier just as an entry point inside the, the platform. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions there. Pass the mic in front of you. Oh, you had it. Uh -huh. For your talk, my question is: uh, When you deploy multiple nodes over a, ge a geographic region, yes. and the network capacity is rather <laughs> limited, and you have stations roaming from one region to another, are you able to handle r roaming, and uh, are you able to handle limited capacity in the network? Yes, that's as long as you replicate information about one node, the, about the states within one node to the others, they will all know the same thing. So basically at every single point, all nodes will know the profile and, uh, how, uh, and, and the location of, of the user. So it's very easy to probe, to move the clients to a node. And capacity, what is uh, the need? In terms of hardware or, or what? Uh, or So it or or what? It depends uh, on the data that, that you are. Uh, is this a question of how many? Yeah. yeah. Is this a question of how many traffic does open can open switch handle? It's. Uh, Wait, uh, I'm sorry, Louis. <laughs> so oh. this was okay. 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 Science. We have. To, we can continue the discussion. <laughs> yes. Outside okay. Because, so it's uh, it's yeah. highly scalable. It will handle tons of packets, thousands of CPS. <laughs> okay. Thank you.